every spot on this tape holds a single symbol of your alphabet. If your alphabet's binary, then they hold zeros and ones. The finite state machine sits over here and controls this tape. This tape is your only data structure. Depending on what state you're in, and depending on what symbol is on the tape, you can write a new symbol there and move to the right or left. Okay? So you have two-way motion on this tape. You can write on the tape, and you can move to the right or left after you're done writing on the tape, and, that, and then you can move to a different state, remembering that now you're going to do something else. Jeff, you have a question? Or? Okay. Okay. Is that instead of the stack, or there's the stack? There's no stack. But certainly, you can make a stack here, right, by just moving over here, putting a symbol, and, and think of it like RAM, right? I mean, if you have RAM, where's your stack? You know, it sits someplace at, the, at this area where nobody's going to ever, like, bother it when, when they ask for new memory, and then it just grows upwards in memory. So you could have a stack that grows, you know, out this way, and then if you ever get to it, and you're going to overflow into it, just shift it all down one. Right? So I mean, you, you, you can make stacks. You can make lots of stacks on this tape. So is this memory, is this addressable? No. No. But it's effectively addressable. You could actually number the cells. You get, I, I'm going to, yeah, it, it's a really good question. The, the, Michael's asking, you know, can you say I want to go to cell number 52 and just go there? You can't. All you can do is look at a cell, see what state you're in, and move left or right. But I could write little Turing machine procedures that fill this tape with little numbers and little empty spots for data. And write a little Turing machine procedure that takes a number like 52 and moves along the tape looking for that number 52 and stops the head right at the beginning of the data space after 52. So I can simulate, uh, I can simulate RAM with a single tape. It's not what you'd want to do normally, but you can do it conceptually. So anything you can think of as far as storing information, you could do with this Turing machine. Actually doing it is another story. How do you count? Just with a finite state? You count by using the tape. If you count it with a finite state, there would be a limit to how much you could count. But if you want to count, you can just start writing one and start adding one. Make a little binary adder and shifting it over and carrying the one, and if it's a one and one, go to a zero, and... So I can write a little addition between a finite state machine. Sure. You can definitely write an addition algorithm in a finite state machine. You can describe it to me yourself. Basically, you know... Here. Let's do an add one, right? Go to the end of the string. If it's zero, just change it to a one and you're done. If it's one, change it to a zero and move left. And then do a loop. So that description is a finite description, and it uses this infinite tape to let you do it on numbers as big as you want, and that's a counter. And you can surround your counter with special symbols on your tape, you know, like a sequence of six ones at one end and a sequence of six ones at the other end or something. You know, and, and you look for those sequence of six ones to know that my counter is here, and that's where I'm going to go. Usually we use special symbols like a pound sign on either side. The alphabet of your Turing machine can be as big as you want, zeros, ones, special symbols, you know, A's and B's, whatever you want to put in, just like a finite state machine. All right. So that's all a Turing machine can do. It's very simple, bare bones, but it's enough to do everything. It's enough to do anything you can write a computer program to do, including object-oriented, hierarchical, blah dee -dee blah You could do it all here. I mean, you could do recursion on this. You can do anything. Okay. What does the program look like? Well, we're going to try to keep our same notation for programs, using you know, states to be circles and transitions between states to be arrows. And now we have to imagine what's going to be on these arrows or transitions. For a finite state machine, the only thing on the arrows was what? The input was the input symbol. For a pushdown machine, the arrows had an input symbol, the top of the stack, and then something that represented how we manipulated the stack, whether we pushed it or popped it. Here, every arrow is going to have a symbol that we're looking at, followed by a new symbol that we're writing on it, on top of it. It erases the old symbol. Followed by 
capital R or capital L, saying whether you're moving right or left. So three things on every arrow. OK? I'm going to say yes, but I'm going to get rid of the always, because th we'll talk about it. There's different ways of thinking about a Turing machine. But the standard thing is imagine that the input is given to you from the left end to the right, and after it's done, there's nothing but blanks. Capital B's represent blanks on the tape, and the tape is full, of bl full, full with blanks. So you can tell when you get to the end of your input when you see a blank. And you can certainly, here's the thing. The reason I said always, yeah, the input is given to you here, but if you want to kind of not lose your input, you could easily copy it over to any other place on the tape. It doesn't take much of a Turing machine program to say, look at this symbol, move over until a blank, copy the symbol there, move back, get the next symbol, copy it, move back, get the next symbol, copy it. I mean, it's a long job to copy a bunch of symbols in a Turing machine instead of just you know, a single memory instruction, but you could certainly copy it anywhere you wanted and never lose it. So once the input's given to you, you could clean off the tape, put it way down there, and use this as your work area. How does this differ from a two-way pushdown machine? Where, where does the extra power come Being able to go, being able to go left and right and right on the tape anywhere you want is more powerful than the stack. A two-way pushdown machine can go back and forth on the input, but it can only use a data structure that's uh, last than first out. And this lets you use any data structure at all. But Chris is asking a good question. If I allow a two-way machine to have two stacks, then it can actually do everything here. And that's not such a hard proof. Maybe I should finally just explain that. I've been saying it about a dozen times this year, right? Now that you know what a Turing machine is, let's figure out how to do it with only two stacks instead of this big tape. Here's what a Turing machine looks like at some point in its, in its execution. It's looking at the zero, and there's a whole bunch of symbols to the right, and a whole bunch of symbols to the left, and the arbitrarily long to the right, arbitrarily long to the left. Here's the idea of doing it with two stacks. Let's say you want to write a one here and move to the right. So the next picture would look like this. And the head would be here. OK? Write a one and move to the right. All you have to do is imagine that somebody snipped this infinite tape in half. And this side is one stack, and this side is one stack. And when I go ahead and change and write something and move to the right, I'm pushing onto the left stack, and I'm moving to look at the other stack. And if I go left, I push on the right stack, and I move to look at the left stack. It's just a matter of moving your symbols. An infinite tape is simulatable with two stacks. When you move to the left, pop it off this guy, push it over to this guy. When you move to the right, do the same thing. So two stacks is enough to, to represent any kind of uh, general tape that goes infinitely. That's kind of the idea. Does that make sense? Some of you it does. All right. We need to get into some real examples, I think to actually do one. As tedious as that can be, it's also, I think, a little illuminating. So, let's do, uh, let's start with this. We're moving our way out of the hierarchy. It's like those science museums. There is the Earth, there is the Sun, there is your galaxy. All right, so we're going to move our way out, out to the beautiful nebulas. We're going to do this not the way a finite state machine does it. Well, because it can't do it. <laughs> we're going to do this not the way a pushdown machine does it. We're going to, well, here's my strategy at least. We're going to see these zeros and ones. I'm going to see a zero. If I see a zero, I mark it with an X. And then I move all the way over until I see a one. When I see a one, I mark that with an X. So I see a 0, I see a 1, I cross them both off. Now I go all the way back until I bump into the x that I made before. And then I turn around. I see another 0. I mark that with an x. I go all the way back. I see the symbol I marked off here. I go past it. I see a 1. I check that off. And I say to myself, doing OK. I go back. I do the third one, the third one, the fourth one, the fourth one. Sooner or later, 